Hey, this is Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I want to start this video with a brief detour through the world of anthropology. When studying the interactions between people, it's pretty easy to reason why people do the things they do when the direct trading of resources is involved. I go to work and sit at a desk nine hours a day because I get money for doing so. That behavior is pretty easily explained. What's not so easy to explain is why I spend an hour in traffic to pick up a friend from the airport or give a friendly stranger a beer at a tailgate party for free prior to a football game. In these situations, there's no tangible or measurable net benefit coming to me in exchange for my time or my beer. So how do we explain why I do these things on a semi-regular basis? Well, many anthropologists would say I'm exchanging my time and energy for something called social capital rather than money or a physical good or service. Social scientist Wayne Baker defines social capital as a resource that actors derive from specific social structures and then use to pursue their interest. It is created by changes in the relationships among actors. So in the case of me picking up a friend from the airport, I do a favor for my friend, which changes our relationship dynamic, in the hopes that that change will encourage them to do me a similar favor using their own resources sometime in the future. Although social capital doesn't have an undisputed definition, mostly for political and ideological reasons, almost every social scientist and economist agrees that it does exist in some capacity in almost every group dynamic we humans choose to undertake. Wherever there are relationships or a community, you can bet there will be people trading favors or just giving common courtesy or being nice to one another, all in the hopes of receiving that same treatment back. But just like there are different goods and services we can trade between people, money, electrical work, homes, and food, there's different types of social capital that can be exchanged as well. We already covered things like favors, which are pretty easy to understand. I scratch your back and you scratch mine. But today I want to talk about something more amorphous that exists within the craft beer community. Prestige. I haven't gotten to talk enough about beer yet, so let's use a famous beer as an example. Let's say I offered you a free beer, and all you had to do was pick between one of two choices. The first is Russian River's Pliny the Elder, the world-class imperial IPA that is famous throughout the beer world and the 29th best rated beer on Beer Advocate. The second is an exact clone of that beer of the same quality, taste, and techniques magically brewed by me, an amateur home brewer from the upper Midwest. Which one are you going to choose? I bet a good majority of you would choose Pliny the Elder because it's a prestigious beer, and I don't blame you one bit. Not only do you get the product with more reputation value, but you personally also get a small prestige social capital bonus for yourself. Now you're able to engage in meaningful conversation about Pliny the Elder with other hardcore beer nerds who have tasted this world-class brew. In addition, other beer fans who haven't tried Pliny the Elder may look up to you for that extra little bit of beer knowledge that they haven't acquired yet. This little prestige boost you get from choosing Pliny the Elder is something my magically cloned homebrew can't offer. You can only talk about that beer with me, and it doesn't connect you to the greater beer community like the true Pliny the Elder does. Trying Pliny the Elder might get you a little bit of clout in the greater craft beer community, but some people are able to build up a lot of prestige capital. You can bet if Charlie Papazian, the famed homebrewing and craft beer advocate, walked into the same room as me, I would shut my mouth and listen very intently to whatever it is he had to say. Now, Papazian and I have never met, we have never spoken or had any social media interaction whatsoever, but because he has so much prestige in the community, I would instantly and probably unconsciously alter my behavior and show him more respect than if some average Joe just walked in on th off the street. Such is the power of prestige in social capital. And just like in the beginning where I was trading favors with my friend, many individuals and businesses in the craft beer community trade prestige capital all the time. Just like Pliny the Elder, Treehouse Brewing offers individuals some very exclusive and prestigious beers in exchange for higher prices, long lines, strange hours, and no guarantees that they'll even have the beer you're looking for available. 
Despite the hoops Treehouse has set up, customers are still lining up to get the good beer and that nice little prestige bonus that comes with feeling a part of the Treehouse and greater beer nerd community. And beyond just higher prices for their products, some successful brewers are able to trade prestige for straight cash. On May 3rd, 2017, AB InBev announced they were acquiring North Carolina's Wicked Weed Brewing, and that single announcement shook the craft beer world to its core. What was once the darling of a tough craft beer market in the Deep South had been conquered by what many craft beer fans consider the evil empire. In about 24 hours, Wicked Weed lost thousands of fans, dozens of breweries pulled out of an upcoming festival they were hosting, and a partner brewery they had been working on a collaboration beer with completely abandoned that effort. Putting the justified but emotional reaction of hardcore beer nerds aside for a second, from a purely economic perspective, one would say that the Wicked Weed founders traded their social and prestige capital benefits for money by making that decision to sell. Personally, I don't harbor any resentment towards them and their decision. They are entitled to their values and to make their own decisions. But it does provide us with one of the clearest examples of a craft brewer selling a rather large amount of prestige for cold hard cash. And social trades often happen on a small scale in the craft beer world too, which is one of the reasons people like it so much. Speaking out of personal experience, asking interesting questions, or even just providing engaging conversations or compliments to brewers has gotten me more than a few beers on the house. And amongst beer YouTubers, trading beers to review comes with that extra little prestige benefit of getting a shout out or two on another channel. All these trades and choices we in the craft beer community make on a daily basis form what some anthropologists call a prestige economy. This is a marketplace not of goods and services, but of ideas and reputation. Prior to the mass adoption of social media, much of this economy was hidden from us, lying just below the surface of our daily interactions. It was obvious who was doing really well in the prestige economy prior to social media. 90 stars like Julia Roberts and Robin Williams obviously had a ton of social and prestige capital, but it was harder measuring the prestige of a local food critic or an average member of the public like you or me. Without physically following someone around and studying their actions and interactions, it was really hard to accurately determine how popular someone was. But then the internet came along, and that changed everything. See, right now you and I are already engaged in a prestige economy transaction. Whether you liked some of my previous videos enough to subscribe, such that I have a good reputation in your mind, or this video popped up in your recommended feed and you liked the idea enough to click on the link, right now you are giving me some of your time and attention. In exchange, I'm providing you a thoughtful and slightly self-deprecating organization of my crazy yet interesting analysis of the craft beer community that took me hours to write, even longer to edit, and yet more time to promote to you in the first place. If you really like this video, you might even throw a like and a comment down below further helping promote my video in the context of the YouTube algorithm and increasing my reputation on the platform. In addition, YouTube takes some of that attention you're giving me and diverts it towards the advertisement on this video. And should you divert further attention towards that advertiser, YouTube and I are going to split the ad revenue as compensation for that attention. You and I are trading ideas, attention, and prestige using YouTube as a platform for this transaction. The cool thing about using YouTube and other social media platforms is that we can really measure how much prestige is being exchanged. On every video you watch on my channel, you'll see my subscriber count, number of views, number of comments, likes, and dislikes. And using all those numbers, you can get a pretty good idea of how much prestige someone like me has. And having prestige be this measurable can create some very perverse incentives within the craft beer economy of ideas. Let me give you an example of how craft beer prestige economy can go from trading attention and thoughtful analysis of the beer industry like this video to people stealing social capital from one another and further dividing sides in an already intense debate. For those of you who don't use Reddit, the sixth most popular website in the United States, it's a site where users submit things they think are interesting, and them and the rest of the users vote up or down to have the algorithm promote it to other users. 
It's like the direct democracy version of how Google does their search rankings, but it's possible for users to vote on the comments of other users as well. In the part of the website that's dedicated to beer content, there was a nice article about how Dogfish Head is really embracing the independent beer seal by prominently featuring it on their packaging. The article itself was well received by the Reddit's beer focused users, but one comment in the thread about it shows how you can earn prestige at the expense of someone else. Blocking out the usernames here for privacy reasons, one user wrote, Wish I liked any of that dogfish head stuff. It's a hoppy bitter mess with no balance or no surprise to my taste. May as well drink a Sam Adams or an Elysian if I wanted that. Love their support and craft, however, just not my personal style of good beer. Now this is clearly just his opinion, and in the context of being a comment about this article, he's actually agreeing that it's a good thing that Dogfish Head is featuring the logo. He just doesn't like their beer all that much. A perfectly fine opinion to have that isn't really harassing in any way. I personally like their beer, but everybody's got different tastes. But in the prestige economy of Reddit, apparently this opinion is unacceptable. So much so that it received enough downvotes to bring the total score to negative 59. That's such a negative response that Reddit automatically hides the comment unlike those with positive and neutral scores. All for what is a perfectly legitimate opinion that just doesn't fit the common craft beer orthodoxy that Dogfish Head is a good and prestigious brand. This user is essentially being encouraged to self-censor and not share their opinions anymore because they don't fit with the popular opinion of the group. But not only did someone get reputation points taken away for simply expressing their own opinion, but in this prestige economy, someone else got to gain from their misfortune. Here is a comment made in response to the original comment, and it really gets my blood boiling. Lots of people don't care for Dogfish Head's IPAs, but the reasons why you say you don't like them are just kind of wrong? Wrong? How can you say someone's personal choice is wrong? I mean, I don't like crazy barrel-aged sour beers as they're a little too funky for my palate, but I don't go around saying people are wrong for liking them. And what's crazier is that the guy he's responding to still agrees with the thesis of the original article. But because he didn't completely toe the line, this guy gets to swoop in and grab 57 car comment karma points, upping his comments in Reddit's algorithm in just the way same way that likes help my video here on YouTube. This guy gets additional prestige and recognition on the site for asking another user do you just not like IPA? I would personally be pretty insulted having some random guy on the internet question my taste in beer simply for not following a popular opinion, and I would probably not engage with this person, just like the original commenter from this thread did. But instead, the legitimate opinion is punished while this craft beer, bible thumping, gaslighting, internet gatekeeping, comment bullshit is readily rewarded by this perverse section of the craft beer prestige economy. Now, you might think I'm being a little oversensitive. After all, this was just one comment on one thread. And it's not like these two were even all that mean to each other. Well, come with me to Twitter and let's take a look at how some craft beer fans treat their macro drinking counterparts in pursuits of likes and retweets. Barkeep, Bud Lights for everyone. Yeah. Actually, um, I prefer a nice mead. Barkeep, Bud Lights for everyone and a mead. Yeah. Is it autumnal? Bud Lights for everyone and one autumnal mead. Is it malty and full-bodied? Right, because yeah, I like it more. Cancel that mead. Bud Light for the many, not the few. In September 2018, this Bud Light ad hit the airwaves and ignited a firestorm amongst craft beer fans on Twitter. Obviously, Bud Light was taking shots at the folks who take their beverage choices so seriously that they turned down free beer in favor of a malt-forward, full-bodied, autumnal mead. Now, even some craft beer fans will gladly take shots at over-the-top beer snobs. So what about this ad got people so upset? It was actually the last line said by the narrator that pissed so many people off. Bud Light, for the many, not the few. 
I think this sentence, for the many, not the few, hits at a deep anxiety in the craft beer community, that the core of the craft beer community is made up of mostly middle and upper middle class people with enough money to afford $8 to $10 pints in a tap room that's a 20 minute drive away from their homes. And that really messes with the punk rock, rebel against the corporate beer man mentality that many craft beer fans hold. And the really scary thing for craft beer fans? Bud Light is right. They are the many, and craft beer is the few. Looking at the last complete year of data, in 2017, craft beer volume in the United States was 24.8 million barrels, representing just 12.7 market share by beer volume. Meanwhile, Bud Light alone beat the entire craft beer segment, shipping 33.1 million barrels in 2017, to say nothing of other domestic-like lagers. The numbers don't lie. If you're like me, and you drink a ton of craft beer, and you generally think most options are of better quality than the domestic options, then you are in the top 13% of beer consumers on quality. This reality is actually kind of strange to me. I personally don't consume a lot of high-end quality products. I definitely don't drive a top 13% car. I don't live in a top 13% home, and I'm certainly not a top 13% YouTuber. But if you're a beer nerd like me, you're a high-end consumer in this industry. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Well, Unless you're angry about that fact and use your status to insult others in order to gain prestige in the craft beer community. Bold strategy by Bud Light to have their model for the many. It's essentially saying our beer is for the lowest common denominator. I went ahead and removed any account information from this tweet as the whole point of this video is to not insult others for personal gain, but wow, this is quite the elitist sentiment. God forbid someone enjoy a Bud Light, something millions of people do every day because if they do, clearly there's some sort of simpleton. Drink a beer I don't particularly like? You must be stupid or crazy, or at the very least, just uneducated to the glories of craft beer. Hey Ryan, that's not fair. You're clearly reading too much into this tweet. Fine, maybe so. But let me show you some of the more popular tweets that got even more likes and retweets about this ad campaign. The Bud Light for the many dilly dilly bullshit lowest common denominator marketing campaign is literally the commercial embodiment of Trump's anti-intellectual expect less mentality. Guys, where do tweets like this even come from? I don't remember any Trump rallies where people were chanting for the many between bouts of build the wall and lock her up. Why would you even make such an assumption about so many Americans? And yes, I am aware that those who voted for Trump are probably more likely to enjoy a domestic light lager over other drinks. But anti-intellectual? As I just proved earlier in this video, Bud Light is just reflecting the reality that they are, in fact, the many. I don't see how accurately portraying reality in a humorous way is anti-intellectual. Those Bud Light for the many, not the few commercials should just have some asshole in a MAGA hat talking about how he only drinks piss water. Another great one, as this one had probably the most likes of any that I found about that ad, and I just wonder what this beer fan hopes to accomplish with a tweet like this. Do they get their rocks off insulting people's beer choices online? Or do they just need another outlet for Trump rage by throwing shade at people who drink Bud Light? But this wasn't just some one-off case of community rage against a particularly cutting ad campaign. This is part of a greater trend. I know videos on the Bud Light corn syrup Super Bowl ad have been done to death. And don't get me wrong, there are plenty of legitimate critiques to be made about that ad. Why did Bud Light choose not to disclose that they use rice sugar as part of their adjunct additions? Why are they pitting fans of brands they owned against one another? Or, as this tweet points out, do their fans even care about ingredients and nutritional content in the first place? But then the dark side of the craft beer economy rears its ugly head again. Likes and retweets being exchanged for insults towards people who are different than me. <laughs> Anyone who drinks Bud Light or any other domestic beer needs their head examined. Craft and imports is where it's at when it comes to good tasting quality beer. 
Hashtag Bud Light. Hashtag Bud Light sucks. Bud Light is staging a Trojan horse theme commercial and its Middle Ages theme has to be some sign about the death of classical education. If they drink Bud Light, Miller Light, or Coors Light, they probably racist. I'm not saying Bud Light or AB and Bev is above criticism. God knows they do enough shady business deals and are far from fully transparent with their consumers. And I'm not opposed to airing those grievances on Twitter, Reddit, or here on YouTube. But punching down at other beer fans, calling them racist or dumb or questioning whether or not they even like IPAs simply for choosing a different beer than you? Also, you could get some likes or retweets or upvotes or beer nerd cred. That is the dark side of the craft beer prestige economy. And if you feel like calling me a corporate shill or a hypocrite in the comments section below, go right ahead. I'm sure if you look back through my old videos here, you'd probably find an example or two of me insulting Bud Light or other low price beers here on the channel. But as a young man who is striving to become a better person and build some better things into this world, I am now resolved to stop participating in this dark side of the craft beer prestige economy. And I will gladly explain to you why. I love craft beer. I love the beer. I love that it's more local. I love all sorts of great people I've met and conversed with who share this passion with me. And for the most part, I love the greater beer community. And perhaps selfishly, I want that community to continue to grow. Not only because it gives me more and more beer choices or more distinct local flavors, but it gives me more great people to meet and talk to. More common ground for conversations in a political and social era where common ground is harder and harder to come by. Sharing the common ground of craft beer has introduced me to so many cool people, great stories, and different perspectives that I want to continue to grow and evolve. But tweets like this and the elitism implied by it, this limits the growth of the community I love so much. For the beer community that constantly talks a big game about how we want more diversity and need to appeal to groups with different values or lower socioeconomic status, we are so quick to give both tacit and explicit approval to those who insult the beer choices of others. The dark side many people see does not indicate that craft beer is an open and welcoming community dedicated to growing, and I know that it is. These tweets turn people away from craft beer, not welcome them to it. And I believe that this attitude, if allowed to grow unchecked, will spell the beginning of the end for the golden age of craft beer here in the United States. When the industry stops winning additional consumers in this competitive marketplace, the craft brewery closures and consolidations will begin. So beer nerds, if you've made it all the way to this point in the video, you're probably thinking, what on earth do we do about it? Well, I have a pretty simple ask for you if you agree with me that these prestige transactions represent a significant threat to craft beer. Don't go around engaging with trolls or assholes on the internet. Don't tell them to stop being a jerk. That never seems to really go or work out well. No, the best thing we can do is to be thoughtful with our likes, our views, and our retweets. Don't feed purely negative content like this into social media's algorithms. Don't give prestige to those who didn't earn it. Like and share thoughtful posts that have well thought out criticisms, not poor insults of other beer fans. If we can resolve ourselves to a bit of a digital diet and engage with content that reflects on the community in a positive light, we can minimize this dark side of the craft beer prestige economy and keep the craft beer community growing and just have less negativity present in our lives. So today, here on Beer by the Numbers, I'm making a resolution. No more piss water comments. Make no assumptions about people based on their beer choices and criticize thoughtfully. I hope you'll join me in this effort to make the craft beer community as welcoming as possible. Cheers.